Well, good morning. I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to open with me this morning to John 13. John chapter 13, we will be reading from verses 34 and 35 in a moment. It is a privilege to be here at Gateway Seminary, a place that is dear to my heart, to my family's heart. As a local church pastor, uh, this week is one of my favorite weeks of the year. I affectionately refer to it as my Super Bowl at the church. It's our church in Barstow can be a little traditional, and, and this week actually is one of the more traditional weeks of the year for our church. We have several services leading into the celebration of Easter on Sunday morning. On liturgical calendars today is Maundy Thursday. Tonight, actually, at my church is one of my favorite services each year at our church where we celebrate Christ's last meal with his disciples, where he washed their feet. Our church celebrates this by taking the Lord's Supper together. And I always, I always love this service and really enjoy any time we take the supper together because we're uniting with brothers and sisters across cultural and language barriers. Not just that, we're, we're linking arms with, with brothers and sisters from centuries before. There's nothing quite like it. There's... Also, though, a danger with tradition. And each year, as I'm leading into traditional services like ours, I, I'm commonly thinking about the danger that this, this week and the, the events that we rehearse every year can become so commonplace that we start treating it like the same old story we've heard hundreds of times. Now, as a pastor, that, that's on my heart. I don't want us to become so over-familiar with these amazing truths. So as I've been preparing this week for services, I found myself praying that God would show us that these old truths can shape us in new ways. And, and I've become more and more convicted that the way to fight over-familiarity isn't to eliminate tradition altogether, but to lean into the biblical truths that they point to. And so tonight, as I gather with my church, we will lean in to the truth behind the Lord's Supper. This morning, I want us to look at a passage that falls within that context, a commandment that Jesus gives to his disciples. And it's really dealing with a very similar type issue because what Jesus issues them sounds like a very old commandment, but he says that it is a new commandment. So I want you to join with me as we look in John 13. We'll read verses 34 and 35, which say this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus commands his disciples to love one another. And we've already noted that this is an interesting command because although we see similar instructions all throughout the Bible, Jesus calls this a new command. So we've titled this sermon the question that comes up immediately, what's so new about love? You you see, these disciples could all probably quote the second half of Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Others come to Jesus and quote this to him during his ministry. Matthew relates that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount had told them not only to love one another and love others, but to love their enemies. So what makes this such a new command? Quite simply, we see in this passage that the events at the end of the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus, call them to a new love 
Christ commands his disciples to Christian love that is based on his work. This command is, not new, is new not because it nullifies the previous commands to love, but has a new gospel focus. And so for a few moments, I want us to look at that and see what this passage teaches us about love. The first thing I believe this passage teaches us is the foundation of Christian love, the sacrifice of Christ. In verse 34, he, he calls his disciples to love one another, and you note that phrase, just as I have loved you. This is one of the defining marks of Christian love. That, that, that's the basis and example for their love for one another is the love of Christ. So, so we should be asking ourselves, how did Jesus love us? And the answer is found throughout the Gospels. It's reiterated in John 13 in the entire chapter, verse 1, setting the context of this chapter, says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had, had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So this entire chapter, the entire context is the love of Christ for his disciples in his last days. And he shows them this love. And in verse 5, when we read that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Later in verses 14 and 15, he, he tells them to lovingly serve one another in the same way. In fact, in verse 15, that, that the Greek is the same kind of, of structure that we have here where he says, just as I have done, you do this. He loves them by serving them. But friends, we can't miss the bigger picture of Christ's love in John 13. You see, his love for his disciples didn't stop with physically washing their feet. When Peter questions him in verses 7 through 11, Jesus explains that this physical act points to a spiritual deeper truth, a deeper cleansing that they would only understand later. In the coming days, he would die on a cross. And they would eventually understand that by his death and resurrection, he would cleanse them of sin. And that is the basis for their love. John later reflects on this truth in 1 John when he says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus loved his own by coming to this earth, by serving them, and by dying for their sins. So, so see the theological undergirding to the truth here, church, uh, that, that our love, our obedience to love is grounded and empowered by God's work. As he told the Israelites at the beginning of the Ten Commandments, prior to those commandments, Exodus 20, verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I loved you. I rescued you. So in light of that love, obey. And that's the same point he's giving the disciples here. He, he loved them. And that love propels them to love one another in the same way. And it's really the same point for us this morning. We love one another as Christ loves us. I'm a dad. I have two kids, a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. And I remember when my daughter was born, we were in seminary. And we had many parents around us in seminary, wise parents who gave us all sorts of great advice and we formed our parenting style often by these mentors and friends around us. But as we got a little older and our kids got older, we also learned there's another influence on our parenting style that we never saw coming. It's our own parents and how we were raised, right? Uh, I'm from Mississippi, they said. And um, in Mississippi, you're raised on this weird mix of church, NASCAR, and professional wrestling. Um, we call it wrestling in my home. And sometimes that creeps out in my parenting style, right? And my, my wife will often say after I say something or do something, you are just like your dad. We tend, for better or worse, to raise our kids and teach them in the way that we were taught. As humans, that is 
part of our tendency, right? And Jesus is leaning on that truth. He's giving his disciples a, a reminder of that truth by pointing to himself and how he taught them to love. You see, just as we reflect the family that we were born into and that we were raised into, those of us who have been reborn into Christ's family will reflect the love of Christ. How does he love us? In humility, he took the form of a servant and served his people. With radical loyalty and forgiveness, as Hosea takes an unfaithful wife back and sacrificially dying in the place of his people, church, that is the ground of our love, an example of our love. Paul, Paul says it this way in Ephesians 5, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And, and if you remember that passage in the next sections, Paul fleshes that out in human relationships. Verses 22 through 33, he, he talks about marriage relationships. Husbands and wives love each other in the same way that they love Christ and that he loved them. The next chapter, he goes to children and parents. He even talks about human relationships and working relationships between servants and masters. And the overarching point is that the gospel doesn't just change our status before God, and it certainly does that. It also gives us a new ethic, a new way to live in this world that isn't based on how I'm feeling each day. It isn't based on whether or not that person reciprocates my goodwill towards them. It isn't based on whether we agree on every issue. It's based on the sacrificial love of Christ. And that love especially relates to our relationships in the church. And that's the second point I believe we get out of this passage, the recipients of Christian love in the community of Christ. You see that in the text in verses 34 and 35, Jesus tells his disciples three times that they are to love one another. You see, this, this command specifically applies to their relationship in community that is established by the gospel. Verse 33, he just referred to them as little children, part of a family. And although there are numerous calls in the Old and New Testaments, to, including from Jesus, to love all of our neighbors, including our enemies, this command is particularly focused on love within the church. We see this command repeated throughout the New Testament. Just a few examples, Romans 12.10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 1 Peter 1.22 Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. 1 John 4.7 Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. We, we could go on and on. Christians are commanded to love one another as the family of Christ. And just as I raise my kids often, by the way, I was raised, there, there are phrases I use that my dad taught me growing up, whether he meant to or not, right? <laughs> One of some of my favorites, uh, to be the man, you got to beat the man, which is Ric Flair, a professional wrestler. Um, my wife says I have to stop talking about wrestling, but she ain't here, all right? <laughs> Another one my dad would say is, is you, you kids think I'm Daddy Warbucks or something. Maybe your kids. You, I don't even know who that is to this day. I think it's a little orphan Annie or something. But one of the most memorable was when my brother and I would argue, he would repeat that old proverb that probably you've heard, blood is thicker than water, which means that family relationships are stronger and deeper than others. I actually looked that phrase up this week. That proverb goes back like eight centuries. And there's a reason why, why that's such an old saying, because it's true. Family relationships are some of the strongest that you and I have in this world. And Jesus, his call to love one another in Christian community relates to that truth. By his blood, Jesus has brought us into a new family as brothers and sisters. 
And so Jesus is telling his disciples here that we love one another as family. And that isn't always easy. There's a reason why my dad had to repeat that often for me growing up. Because family relationships can be challenging. We know each other's faults more than we would a stranger's. We, we have history together. We, we, we know how, exactly how to push each other's buttons in the family. There's a reason why this command is given. Because Jesus knows we need it. Christian, we're called to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're called to love that bitter older brother, the annoying younger brother. We're called to love our parents and children in the faith. We're even called to love that crazy cousin that nobody wants to sit with at the family reunion. I tell my church often, if you don't know who that is, it's probably you and your family. <laughs> We're called to love the people of God. We need this instruction when, when the daily life of the church frustrates us. We need this instruction when church members bicker and complain. When division rises. My, my, my daily prayer is that I would fall more and more in love with God's people. One of the greatest pieces of advice I got as I was coming to Barstow came from former pastor of our church, who many of you know. And he said, Steve, Barstow is an interesting place, but if you love them, they will follow you. The New Testament gives us plenty of examples of what that love may look like in the community. We, we pray for one another, Ephesians 6, 18. We, we bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2. We instruct and encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. We serve one another, Galatians 5, 13, because that's what families do. And that love doesn't just influence the church. I want us to see this last point here, the effect of Christian love in the reputation of Christ See the second half of that command in verse 35? By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Although Christ's command was specifically about loving one another in gospel community, that doesn't mean we disregard those outside of the family. You see, some have read texts like this in John and have argued that this shows a sectarian side to the gospel and the community that he's writing to but I think that misses the overall point of John and the emphasis throughout the book on the entire world. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. After his resurrection, Jesus sends his disciples into the world with the gospel. John 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So we can't divorce this command from the larger picture of the New Testament, which, which teaches us that our love for one another is good for the world around us. Far from saying that they should love one another and ignore the world, Jesus said that their love for one another is proof to an unloving and dying world that the love of Christ is real and that it changes lives. Christian love is an observable fruit of following Christ, and really the opposite is true as well. Lack of love is a sign of a lack of faith, 1 John 3.14. We know that we passed out of death into life because we've loved the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Christian love is so observable in our world because it contrasts everything in our world. The world says that, that love is all about self-service and pleasure. But Christian love says that the ultimate satisfaction comes not from self-service, but love to God and neighbor. And so Jesus is telling his disciples that we love one another in contrast to an unloving world. And that's why it's so noticeable. I'm reminded of the story of the Roman emperor Julian in the 4th century who turned from Christianity to paganism. Um, he's, he's usually called Julian the Apostate, which if you can't guess, you usually don't give that name to somebody who loves Christians. But 
He, he hated Christians. He wanted to rid Christians of the empire, but he couldn't because they were too powerful. And the Christians weren't too powerful in political or military strength. They were powerful in love. Check out what he says in a letter. It says, atheism, which is what he called Christianity, has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there's not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. The love of Christians was so strong that even their most hated enemies were saying, why does our own government not love our people this much? That's the point Jesus is making here. Christian love is so radical that the world around us can't help but to notice. Our love for one another is really one of our greatest evangelism tools. John Chrysostom said it this way, the passing over the miracles that they were to perform, he makes love the distinguishing mark of his followers. Miracles do not attract unbelievers as much as the way you live your life. Nothing brings about a proper life as much as love. Christian, our prayer shouldn't be that we would be more charismatic or have greater giftings. It should be that we have greater love. Our love for one another is for the good of the church, but it's also good for the world around us. By this love, others will know that we follow a loving Savior. Christ commands his disciples to Christian love. So the main application of this passage isn't hard for us to see, although it may be hard for us to follow. D.A. Carson notes this on this passage. That the new command is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate. Profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. We need this new command today. Tonight, I will lead my church as we take the Lord's Supper together. Because Jesus taught us that this supper would be a marker for the community. And I praise God that every time we take that supper, we're joining in with that marker. But in this text, we see that that wasn't the only marker that Jesus gave his followers on the night that he was betrayed. He told them to love one another. He gave them an ethical mark, the command to love. So I ask you this morning, are you carrying this mark in the next few days, we will rehearse the events of Christ's death and resurrection. The great work of love by our Savior. But we must start by asking, do you know that love? Just because we're at a seminary chapel doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask ourselves this morning whether we have truly placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Have you Place your faith in him, and has your life been changed by the love of Christ, by his sacrificial love? If not, the call of this text and the call of all of Scripture is that you would know that love. Place your faith in him today. Without it, Christian, we will never love one another in the way that Christ calls us to love. Christian, are you living out this love? Are you living it out in the family of Christ? Quite simply, are, are, are you part of a local community of believers living out the gospel? By praying for, encouraging one another, and, and, and teaching one another. We can't do that if we're not part of the local community. So I ask you, are you part of a community of Christ? And Christian, are you showing that love? Maybe there's someone who you struggle to show that love with. Maybe it's a church member. Maybe it's a coworker or a boss. Maybe it's a friend or maybe it's someone that's part of your biological family this morning. The call of this text is to love them. 
Maybe you've sinned against them. Repent and go to them this morning. Christians, brothers and sisters, we are called to love. Christ's love affects all of our relationships. As we reflect on the death of Christ on Good Friday, let's ask if his death has led us to love in the same way. And finally, is our love for one another palpable to the world outside the church? Ministry leaders, is your ministry marked more by the love of Christ than it is the personality or opinions of its leaders? Are our churches known for love? I pray this Easter weekend that the death and resurrection of Christ that we've maybe read many times, maybe we've listened to many times before, I pray that it will transform us in new ways, that it would lead us to a greater love for Christ and for one another. Let's go from this place today and let's love one another. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we love you. We thank you for the sacrificial love that you show us that we will rehearse this week as we look at the death and resurrection of you, our Savior. And Lord, we pray that that love will transform us and lead us to love one another in a greater and deeper way. Lord, I thank you that your gospel empowers us to love. And I pray that we would love one another. It's in your name that I pray, Jesus. Amen.